Hello, my name is Gary Ross, and I'm Vice President and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Colgate University. Thank you so much for joining us in our webinar. There are a number of questions that people might have about the college admission process. And so what we hope to do with you during the course of our webinar is to address some of those questions. And we hope to be able to address matters relating to admission and financial aid that might actually be on your mind. I've got some terrific colleagues to work with today. I'm a little biased, but I think you'll find that they can provide you with a tremendous amount of information about an area that is sometimes so perplexing and more than a little intimidating to so many people. So I'd like you to meet those colleagues. And let me start off by asking Gina if you would introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gina Solis. I'm Senior Associate Dean and Director of Financial Aid. Hello, my name is Lynn Holcomb. I'm Senior Associate Dean of Admission and Colgate Class of 1992. Hello, everyone. I'm Jameer Abney, Senior Assistant Dean of Admission and Coordinator of Multicultural Recruitment. Here's what we have in mind for today. We just spent the better part of uh, the last eight weeks or so traveling all around the country and all around the world. We had admission officers in many of the 50 states and a large number of countries outside of the United States. And what we have done is we've compiled questions from those students and parents that we had contact with in many of the locations that we visited. And we're now going to be using those questions as the basis for our conversation. I think you'll find if you sit through the entire webinar that our questions will be focusing on issues that are very much on the minds of people who are either applying for admission themselves or figuring out how to pay for a four-year college or university experience. We hope it will be a useful experience for you to see what it is that we are discussing because of the fact that these are questions that actually came from people who are just like you. So why don't we get started? Lynn, I think I'll, I'll ask you first. This came from a question that we received in LaPorte, Indiana, and it's a pretty important question for any college or university student if they are thinking about the po potential of applying to Colgate University. What is Colgate looking for in an applicant? Thanks, Gary. Um, we'll, we'll start with a rather broad question, but as Gary said, probably one of the more important questions we get as we're talking with high school students about the application process. When we're looking at an applicant to Colgate, we want to make sure that the student is going to be both academically prepared and a good fit for Colgate University, and also be a good fit for the campus experience here at Colgate. Our review process is what we like to call holistic, meaning that we will look at all parts of the application. And we are first going to make sure that the student has the academic promise that's going to be a good fit for the level of coursework here at Colgate. It's important to know the institution to which you're applying. So for example, here at Colgate, our classes are going to be small. The average class size is just 17 students and the student to faculty ratio is nine to one. So we're looking for students who are going to be excited about being in an active learning environment. So when we review their academic profile, we'll be looking at factors in their application that include their high school transcript, and most importantly, the quality of the courses that they've taken. Everything that we review in the application process will be about the context of their high school and making sure that we understand their course selection and context of what's available and um, accessible to them in their high school experience. And for most students, that will be a sampling of honors, accelerated, advanced placement, or international baccalaureate level classes. But again, it will be dependent upon their high school. Their performance in those classes will very much be dependent upon the rigor of their courses. So we want to see how well they're doing um, in a high level class um, expectation because the courses at Colgate will be challenging. In addition to their academic transcript, we also will be looking to see their quality of writing in their essays. We'll be looking at academic references and their recommendations because we do want to see that there are students who are going to engage in the learning process and be excited about that interaction with our faculty. Colgate classes are taught by full-time faculty. We do not have teaching assistants um, teaching the classes, so it is about that engagement that comes in the academic environment. 
We also will ask our students to look at standardized testing. We do require either the submission of the ACT or the SAT. And in addition, we will look to see the personal profile and how they'll fit with life on a residential college campus. We are a place where our students are active 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we will look for that resume, for activities, see their interests, see their passions. We will look at character references and recommendations. And we'll also look to their essays to see their personal voice, how have they humanized the application because ultimately this is going to be about a fit with the institution and we will want to make sure that they have the academic preparation but that they're also the right fit for a residential college town experience as we offer here at Colgate. I think there was something you wanted to add. Did you want to add to that I, Gary? I wanted to add something <clears throat> and follow up really to, to something that you mentioned that I think is really important and that's the area of context. We get out to so many different high schools, as I mentioned, around the country and around the world, but we don't get to them all. And so there might be students or parents watching this video tonight saying, I live in a really small town in an area that's very remote and college representatives never get to my area. How will Colgate be able to figure out if I'm competitive or not? Can you talk a little sure. bit about uh, the fact that we can't get to every high school and how we can still make a responsible decision on an application? Sure, and, that, and that's a great point. Um, most colleges, Colgate is no different, we work on a regional management system. So there will be a regional staff member who's responsible for the high schools in your region. And it is our job as a professional to know and, and learn about the qualities that are available in your high school. Most applications will be submitted from your high school with what's called a high school profile, which gives us a broad overview of your high school, the curriculum that's Offer, the grading standard, clubs and activities, just a nice little snapshot of your high school experience and community. If that isn't available, we'll do some research. We're very comfortable to pick up the phone and call your guidance counselor, call the principal at your school, um, or we'll do some of our own, our own research to see if there is a school profile on the website. Um, we will always make sure we have the answer to that question. Um, we never want to leave any stone unturned. We want to make sure that we really do understand the applicant as they're coming in, but that really starts first with a regional staff member, um, and that is available on Colgate website. We have the admission staff, and it is um, identified which regions of the country we do cover, and that is a great place to start. Um, if you know you're at a high school where a Colgate representative has not visited, um, not required, but as a student, you could start that outreach and reach out and introduce yourself to your regional staff member and open that line of communication for the Office of Admission. Thank you, Lynn. Gina, a student in Orange County, California asked <laughs> if Colgate offers merit aid. Could you address that? Certainly, yes. That, that's a very common question that we receive. So the, the short answer of that question is no, we don't offer merit-based aid, but we do have a substantial need-based uh, financial aid program here at Colgate. So in order to apply for need-based financial aid, students need to fill out both the FAFSA, and that stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's the application that students use to apply specifically for federal aid. And then they also use the profile, the CSS profile, which is part of the College Board website. And that's how they specifically apply for institutional need-based aid here at Colgate. So by filling out those two applications, students are asking us to look at their eligibility for all of the different types of financial aid that we offer at Colgate. So that would be institutional need-based grant, the Colgate grant program, uh, federal student loans, federal work study, or the Colgate work study program. Um, and we even look at state financial aid, uh, state grant programs as well. I think an important thing to mention here is that Students who are interested in applying for financial aid, they should do that in conjunction with the admission application process. So in other words, both the admission application and financial aid application materials are due before an admission decision is made. And that way, when students get their offers of admission, they'll have both their admit notice as well as their award letter with that admission notice. Thank you, Gina. Jameer, a student in Fairfield, Connecticut, was asking about one of the elements of the application process that Lynn was referring to, and that, of course, is the area of standard testing, standardized testing. The student asked, 
um, how important we consider standardized testing to be in the admission selection process. And the student went on to ask if it's a deal breaker if the student has a very high GPA, but standardized testing, which is not as high. Good question, Gary. Um, I think Lynn did a great job of kind of setting up the fact that we practice a holistic admission review. And then now we're going to consider all parts of the application for a student. But definitely looking at academic preparation, the information that we get from the transcript and your test scores is going to help us understand if you're going to be able to be successful on our campus in a rigorous academic environment, um, such as the one that we have here at Colgate. So definitely understanding how the test score fits into that is a big question. And I think that's just one piece the application that we're going to review and utilize that along with the other information that we receive to best understand both the academic and the personal fit for that individual student. But definitely for those students, as we talked about earlier, that maybe we don't have as much context around their school or where they're coming from, the test score can be more important in helping us recognize their ability to be successful on our campus. So definitely I think the context is an important piece of that. And I think that we do have to consider those students that are coming from places that we're not as familiar with as ter territory and regional managers, but it is not the only piece of the application that we're going to look at. We're definitely going to take the time to sift through the recommendations, the personal statement, the essay, and really dig into the transcript to understand who that student is, how they prepared themselves, but the test score can help us best understand their ability to transition here and get the most out of the educational experience. Thank you, Jameer. Mm -hmm. Gina, going back to you on a financial aid-related question, a student from Minneapolis just asked us, if, is there any wiggle room, to use his <laughs> words, in financial aid? It's funny that this student asked this question. I was watching a show on a major network within the last few weeks. It's college application season. And on this particular show, they said, never accept your first financial aid <laughs> offer. Always try to negotiate it higher. And so the student used the words wiggle room. <laughs> Clear up the mystery for us. Is there any wiggle room in financial aid? Sure, absolutely. So I think the important thing to mention is we collect a lot of information on the financial aid applications. We try to cover all of the bases with special circumstances, uh, really understand a family's financial profile. Um, but probably the fact is, is that we can't get to every single item when a family fills out a couple of financial aid applications online. Um, so we put our best foot forward. <laughs> our awards are based on analyzing the financial aid applications that come in. And so if a family has offered all of their answers, uh, given us a really good picture of what their financial situation looks like, that really is the best offer. But that's not to say that things don't change for families because they can begin filling out the financial aid applications as early as October 1st. So let's say something happens, unforeseen medical expenses, or maybe a parent loses a job. Really, there are a variety of special circumstances that people let us know after they've already submitted those financial aid forms. So if that's the case, or if when they receive their award notice, if it just doesn't sit quite right, if they have questions about it or are just uncomfortable with the decisions that were made, we always invite people to contact us. So they should pick up the phone or they should send us an email and let us know what their concerns are. Does that mean that we'll be able to change awards all the time? No, um, but at least we'll make sure that we've covered everything. We've, we've listened to their story, we know what their personal situation is, and we can address some of those financial concerns that they have. Um, worst case scenario, sometimes we enter into a conversations about other financing options. Mm -hmm. So when we look at what the Colgate grant eligibility is, uh, the federal direct loan program and the work component, let's say a parent might consider borrowing a parent plus loan or they have questions just about other assets they have and how they might need to use those resources to help pay for tuition fees and the other educational expenses that come along with it will help with that aspect too we talk about monthly payment plans other loans that kind of idea thank you gina Lynn, this next question, you've had some practice with it because actually this question is one that was addressed to you when you were in Westchester County, an area that right. you covered for the Office of Admission. <laughs> um, and maybe you can share with the rest of us and the viewers uh, around the country and around the world how you answered it. The question was, mm. 
What is the benefit of early decision and is it easier to get into Colgate through early decision? Sure, thanks Gary. And that, that is a very popular question. Um, there are definitely regions of the country where students are starting their process, their college search process early enough that this concept of early decision and making a binding commitment to one college early is actually something they feel ready to do by their senior year. I do wanna just define that early decision. Um, there are two terms for early applications in the college process. One is called early decision, and that is a binding agreement. Um, a second is called early action, and that allows a student to apply early, be notified early of their decision, but they don't need to commit to the institution until the universal deadline of May 1st. Colgate has an early decision policy, so it is binding. Um, our first deadline is approaching on November 15th for our early decision option one. And you know, the benefit, is there a benefit of early decision? Um, early decision is really a student choice. You have to be, very clear to identify that you have a school that is a top choice, that you have a number one, and you would be ready to say, I'm ready to let go all other offers that I might receive in the college process. And some students are ready to do that. The benefit for an individual at that point um, is that they have gone through the process, identified a clear number one choice, and they're ready to make that commitment. From our perspective, from the Office of Admission perspective, we're looking for the same qualities in a student early decision as we are regular decision. Um, the selectivity, the selection process is similar for early versus regular. The, the only real difference from our perspective is that we're looking to fill our enrollment of our incoming class at you know, 760, 770 students um, in the incoming fall. And if you're early decision, we're looking to fill that class at that point. Um, and there may not be as many students at that point that we're reviewing for those offers as we may in the regular decision process. But in terms of it being easier, it's not a lesser admission process. Um, there's, there's not a lessing of requirements. We really are looking for the same academic and personal qualities of a student as we are early decision. I also do wanna chime in on financial aid and the fact that we are a need-based institution and we do also meet 100% of a student's demonstrated need if they're applying or early decision or if they're applying regular decision. So I think that's a clear indication. Our policy, our expectations are the same for early versus regular. Um, and the real benefit is a personal benefit for the student that they're able to pursue their number one choice um, in an early option and get an earlier notification in the process. Excellent, thank you. We had a student in Wilmington, Delaware, who wanted some clarification on our standardized testing policies. So I'm gonna break this up into two different parts. And Jameer, if I could ask you to respond to part one. Lynn, if you could take sure. on part two. Jameer, part one is, may I submit SAT subject tests instead of the ACT or SAT testing? And Lynn, so you can begin to think about part two. The question is, do you expect Colgate to go test optional in the future? Jameer? No problem, Gary. Well, to address that first part, we will require students to submit their standardized testing to SAT and the ACT. Subject tests currently are not being utilized for us in looking at testing for students, so we don't require those or will not allow a student to submit those in lieu of their other testing. So we would still um, require you to submit the standardized test scores, the SAT or the, S or the ACT. Um, you don't have to submit those with the writing sections. We don't look at the writing portions of those tests, but we will still require those exams. Um, and right now, not looking at the subject tests in any specific way. I'm, I'm always intrigued when I'm on the road, and, and it's even present here in the webinar tonight, the number of questions we get around testing. Um, it obviously is a portion of the application process, but it is not how we make decisions, I think, as we've talked about earlier. Yeah. And, and Colgate is constantly looking at our evaluation process and our procedures to make sure that we're doing the best we can to identify the you know, the true best students coming into our class. At this point, there is not a plan for Colgate to go test optional in the, in the future. Um, the one thing that is important as we think about the role that we look at with testing, it's just one of many factors that we consider, but we also have applicants from all across the U.S. and all across the world. And because there is such a variation in educational standards and educational policy from state to state and country to country, the standardized testing is one common platform that we are able 
able to see and look at our um, all of our applicants on one continuum. As I said, it's not how we make decisions, but there is that value as it brings to the application process now. We'll continue to evaluate our testing policy um, as we go forward, but at this point, there's no plans for Colgate to pursue a test optional plan. Thank you. Gina, if anyone is in a better position to understand that Colgate receives applications and enrolls students from all different parts of the country, <laughs> all different parts of the world, coming from a wide variety of different kinds of backgrounds and circumstances and traditions, it would be the financial aid office. <laughs> I'm sure over the course of any given year, maybe even over the course of any given month, you hear it all in terms of the various kinds of, of challenges that people face as a result of life's circumstances. And so a question that came to us from San Jose, California, um, certainly gets to one of those areas. And that is, how do I apply for financial aid if my parents are divorced? Okay, sure, yes. Um, so it's a, it's a two-part answer. <laughs> so the first part of the answer, I'll talk about the FAFSA. So on the free application for federal student aid, students who are do domestic students, so they're U.S. citizens or permanent residents, when they fill out the FAFSA, if their parents are no longer married, so if they're divorced, separated, maybe they were never married, um, on the FAFSA, a student would fill out the FAFSA using just one parent's financial aid information, or financial information, I should say. So by using one parent's information, we often refer to that as custodial parent information. Let's say there's a situation where a student lives equally between both their mom's house and their dad's house. So they're living exactly 50-50 between two parents' households. If that's the case, when you're choosing who to fill out, who to use on the FAFSA, who to, whose information you should use, you'd want to use the person who provided the most financial support. So again, if it's you live with one parent, we'll have them use that custodial parent who they live with on the FAFSA. If it's split evenly, just the person who provides the most financial support. The question is answered differently when I talk about the profile. So on the profile, actually all households will fill out a profile application. So the student can get started using either parent and just know that both parents and whatever situation that parent is in, they might be remarried or have a new domestic partner. So in each of those households, uh, basically two profiles would be fill out, filled out in the case of uh, a situation where there's either a divorce, a separation, or the parents were never married. Great information. Yeah. Thank you, Gina. Mm -hmm. Jameer, from Tampa, Florida, a student asked us, how does Colgate view applications from students of color and first-generation students? Well, Gary, we look at these applications very similarly to we look at all of our applications in the pool, as Lynn explained earlier. I think she did a good job of understanding or stating kind of the holistic approach that we take. But definitely, as we look at the context of an application, where a student come from, comes from is going to be a big part of that. And especially as we look at students of color, students that are first generation, or students who come from um, underrepresented, low um, socioeconomic backgrounds, those are factors in understanding that, applica that application, that student specifically, not just in terms of the financial aid pieces, but also in understanding the specific challenges that they may have faced and just getting to, to the place of applying to a place like Colgate. So in those specific instances, we are actually taking um, the time to look at some of those applications with extra context. One of the ways that we've done that is with our Office of Undergraduate Studies Scholar Program, or the OUS Scholars as we call them, where we have a set of our staff in the admission office as well as faculty reviewing applications for a group of students who we recognize have faced significant challenges in trying to achieve um, the highest amount of success in terms of their higher education. And so with, with those scholars, we're able to more in-depthly understand the context, the situations, and the specific obstacles that they've overcome and make decisions about these applicants specifically to be able to be admitted and take a, take a part in what we call our Summer Institute. And basically, this is a summer bridge program that allows them to move to campus early, work with administrators and faculty advisors that are going to help them with the transition to campus, and also build community within community as they make the, tr the transition 
transition to a place like Colgate and have an opportunity to have kind of a family within the community to transition with, but also to help them throughout their four years on campus. And OUS um, is just one of the ways that we've tried to provide benefit for these students. We also have a growing first generation initiative program that works specifically with first gen programs. Uh, we also have several key advisors and administrators like myself on campus that are just really keyed into these specific populations and understanding that there are different challenges that exist for students of color and students that are from first generation backgrounds just in trying to navigate and understand the college admission process, the financial aid process, and then also what it is to be on a college campus once you get there. So I think there's also a mind's eye towards things like retention and success in the long term for those students and making sure that they not only have a positive experience in terms of the admission practices, but also a positive and successful experience once they actually get here and are able to graduate and get the most out of their four years with us. Thank you, Jameer. Once again, that word context came up. It's come up now in the application process. It's come up in financial aid. It's come up in how we view people who apply from populations that might be traditionally underrepresented in higher education. And I think it's really important to understand that at Colgate, there is not a cookie cutter approach to applications. Context weaves, it, weaves its way through everything that we do, everything that we read, everything that we consider. So thank you very much for making those important points. Gina, um, an international student, a student who's currently calling Jamaica home, wanted to know how does financial aid work for international students? Absolutely, good question. Um, so Colgate does offer financial aid, need-based financial aid to international students. And as I've been talking about two separate financial aid applications, this is the occasion where there's only one financial aid application. So international students, we ask them to fill out the CSS profile. And by filling out the profile, they too will be considered for the need-based grant program at Colgate. Uh, if their student visa is allows them to be eligible to work on campus, we do have a Colgate work study program as well. And as we've referred to earlier in this program, there is we meet 100% demonstrated need. So that that's the case with international students as well. By filling out the profile, we'll assess their financial need, and they'll receive that financial aid award with their offer of admission. Now there are some occasions when we receive financial aid applications. And uh, in the analysis, there just isn't demonstrated financial need. So that's the one unfortunate piece of news that I have, that if an international student does come in with no financial aid, unfortunately, we won't be able to offer aid for a future semester. Um, but those that do come in, they fill out that application once, and we will make sure that we cover their demonstrated need throughout their enrollment. Thank you, Gina. May I just mention one other thing? Please do. Every once in a while, we'll get a call mm -hmm. or an email from a domestic student, so someone, to, someone who is a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident of the U.S., they might be living abroad. So that's the occasion where we still consider that person to be a domestic student, and so they would fill out both the FAFSA and the profile. And the difference is with that student, if they came in as a no-need student, but over the course of their four years at Colgate, circumstances changed in such a way so that they would qualify for need-based financial aid, we would award that student the aid that he or she demonstrates. That's right. So domestic students, um, and even domestic students living here in the Correct. U.S., that would be yeah. true for that person as well. Um, so someone who doesn't receive need-based aid in their first year uh, is invited to apply in future years, and indeed we would meet 100% demonstrated need in future years. Excellent. Thank you. This next question is a really interesting one for a certain segment of our applicant pool, but I think it can actually be instructive for our entire applicant pool. Lynn, every year when I go visit schools, I'm reminded that although we work with a substantial number of students each year who are taking what's called the IB program, there are still many students, many parents who've never heard of the IB program and have no idea what it is. Could you talk initially about what the IB program is so that those who may not be familiar with it can learn a little bit more about it? Sure. 
And then could you talk about how Colgate considers applications from IB students? Sure. Um, and it is a common question that we get. So many students have this um, real need to make sure we understand their curriculum that's offered in their high school. And there's a wide variety of curricular choices, and just one of those is called the International Baccalaureate Curriculum. Um, and the International Baccalaureate, it's decided by a school whether what curriculum their school will follow. But the International Baccalaureate Curriculum is actually a very very rigorous high school curriculum um, that has students taking in their junior and senior year a realm of six academic solids, three it's what's called a higher level, and then also three at a standard level. And they also are required to do an extended essay, they have an, an, a required theory of knowledge class. So there is a, there's a wide range of academic expectation with the International Baccalaureate curriculum. And I think for students who are pursuing the International Baccalaureate curriculum in their high school, it's important for them to understand that we are very aware of the rigor and expectation that comes with the International Baccalaureate curriculum. But it also, for students who are in a high school who don't offer the International Baccalaureate curriculum, again, we'll never penalize a student for what their high school doesn't offer. And we'll look to see what curricular choices they have available in their high school. And we'll hope that they are taking a strong sampling of that coursework. So some schools may pursue an advanced pace placement curriculum, or some schools have dropped advanced placement and only offer honors or accelerated. There are some schools that don't designate any tracking within their curriculum. And again, this goes back to the regional management that we talked about earlier. We'll make sure we understand the curriculum available in your high school, understand the rigor of that coursework, and that's going to help us understand you as a student and as a person and how you may potentially transition to Colgate if you are offered admission. Thank you. Gina, from Miami, Florida, a student wants to pursue that wiggle room question that we <laughs> ran into before. Specifically, the student asked, what would the process be if an early decision student's financial aid was not considered to be something that the family thought was workable? Okay, great. So I think Lynn may have referred to uh, the early decision process a little bit. And I think a really important factor uh, is to the fact that regular decision and early decision financial aid offers would be exactly the same. So if the financial aid applicant, the admission applicant, had applied regular decision, their award would be exactly the same as the award if they apply as an early decision candidate. So the financial aid eligibility doesn't change based on the admission type. So with that said, I think the same question about our wiggle room earlier, uh, the answer is, is the same. If some extraordinary circumstance comes up that we weren't aware of originally, we want the student and the family to let us know. Early decision is a binding agreement. So I think Lynn may have, have referred to the fact that uh, we want students to know that Colgate is their number one choice. Um, they know that they're committed to Colgate. But if financial aid is a concern, and to have that commitment is a little makes a family a little bit uneasy, a really good tool that they can use ahead of time is called the Net Price Calculator. And so the Net Price Calculator is a link on our website, and they can log right on to colgate.edu, find the Net Price Calculator on the financial aid portion of the website, and by filling out information, it's much shorter than the FAFSA or the profile, but by filling out information online, they can get a really good idea of what their contribution to the education would be. And the net price calculator is specific to Colgate, so it would even give a really good estimate as to what the aid would be at Colgate. So wiggle room, eh, if there's extra circumstances that we didn't know about or maybe wasn't even a factor when they applied for financial aid, um, but we do meet 100% demonstrated need right out of the gate. And then the last thing that I want to mention is when a student deposits, we consider that deposit to be a binding agreement. So when they receive their notice of admission and financial aid and say, yes, Colgate is the place for me and deposit, um, if nothing new changes, we don't expect to hear from them a week or two later to say, ah, oh, could I renegotiate this financial aid award? Um, no, but if any special circumstances come up at any point during the enrollment of that student, we want to hear from them. So if after a deposit was made, um, let's say three months later, 
uh, mom or dad lost their job, and that was a major source of income, if not the entire source of income for the family, you would revisit that? We do want to hear from that family, right? We don't want them to suffer and struggle and regret that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be able to make sure we have all of the different resource options available to them, um, so certainly they should contact us and let us know. Thank you. Jameer, our colleagues who were visiting schools in Miami, Florida and Overland Park, Kansas heard this question and it's one that is now being asked quite frequently. Does Colgate look at demonstrated interest and are interviews required? That's a, that's a good question, Gary. Uh, we don't currently look at demonstrated interests and we don't require interviews. And a lot of the reason around that is just the amount of interest that we have in those opportunities would not allow us to get to meet with all of the students who are interested in interviews. But also I think something that we've alluded to uh, many times already is that we have students that are um, all over the world and all over the country that are interested in pursuing their education at Colgate. And so for some of those students, the opportunity to be able to visit campus or to go to meet with an admission officer, or even to have that opportunity for an interview just isn't there for them, especially when you think about our students that are coming from underrepresented backgrounds, they don't have that opportunity necessarily or the means to be able to visit campus. And so we don't want to penalize them in any specific way by requiring this interview or looking at demonstrated interest for students that the ability to be able to take advantage of some of these options just aren't there for them. And so I think in some ways it's looking at things in a more equitable sense, but also recognizing our bandwidth as a staff and as a team to be able to meet some of the need or the want from students to be able to interview. Um, but we do offer interviews for students who are interested. Um, they're utilized as really an information gathering and fact sharing opportunity. They're not evaluative in any sense. So for those students who are able to visit or are able to meet with an admission officer when they're in their region, that's definitely something we want to take advantage of uh, because we do like the opportunity to get to know students a little bit more and answer specific questions that they might have, especially as they have to do with their own application or their own specific financial aid situation, which may be unique to them. Those are things that we want to take the time to be able to do. Um, we also work with many of our alumni who are living across the country as volunteers for us that will also interview students. So that's another way that they can get that Colgate information and be able to have that one-on-one -on -one time with a Colgate representative um, who actually lives in their area and has a little bit more flexibility in their schedule than some of us might have when we're traveling on the road. So definitely we're offering interviews, we're utilizing them as an info information sharing and fact gathering opportunity but we're not looking at demonstrated interest just because of some of these issues that I mentioned earlier in terms of equity and, and thinking about where students are coming from or what opportunities might or might not be available to them but if we do have those chances to meet with students one-on-one -on -one or give them that time to learn more about them we do want to take advantage of that. Thank you Jameer. Gina, a very important question was asked in San Diego, California, and is no doubt on the minds of many other people as well. Do you provide financial aid for undocumented students? That's a great question, Gary. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes. And to apply, an undocumented or DACA student would fill out the profile. So by filling out the CSS profile, same answer as I've said before, we'll meet 100% demonstrated need for that candidate. The difference is that an undocumented student wouldn't fill out a FAFSA. So there is no federal aid for undocumented students, but Colgate will be sure to meet the need through the Colgate Institutional Program. Thank you. Okay, I would like to transition the conversation a little bit if we could. Up to this point, we've been talking about some really important aid issues that applicants need to consider, and some questions about relating to the entire selection process. Um, to, to use maybe a slang term, what's it going to take to get in, or how will it impact my chances of getting in? But students who are thinking about a college or university, any college or university, also need to think about what it's going to be like when they're actually living at the college or university that they're attending. And so for this next section, what I'd like to do, if we could, is focus more on issues of what it's like to be a Colgate student. What is the experience going to be as you are actually living and walking 
the halls of Colgate University buildings and the pathways along the beautiful campus. So, Lynn, if, if you could start us off, um, let's say that I've just been admitted to Colgate and I've made the decision that Colgate is where I want to be. And so I'm starting to think about the most important reason to go to any college or university, including Colgate University, and that's to get a great education. But I'm also undecided about what it is that I want to pursue academically, and I could just use some advice from people who are at Colgate who might be able to steer me in a direction that would be appropriate for me academically, and maybe also a little bit in terms of my life outside of the classroom. I really need that advice. What is advising like at Colgate? Sure, Carrie, it's a great question. And when we're dealing with students who are obviously looking for an academically driven and challenging academic institution. It's a question that comes up quite a bit about advising. And it's important to understand Colgate is very grounded in the liberal arts. And so we believe in our students coming into Colgate and having a strong foundation to their education. We do have a core curriculum with four classes that are required in our core. And our students will take those classes, be able to engage with Colgate faculty in small classes, be exposed to the curriculum, but their first interaction with a faculty advisor will be through their first year seminar program. And the first year seminar program is actually a topical class so students can identify their top choices from a wide range of academic offerings. And it's a chance for them to be in a small group um, typically, first-year seminars are capped at no more than 18 students, and the faculty member who serves as your academic advisor for your first-year seminar course will serve as your advisor until you declare your academic major. And at Colgate, there you're not required to declare your major until the spring of your sophomore year. We really believe in that liberal arts approach of the breadth of the curriculum, sampling, taking some educational risks, and you'll do so under the guidance of your faculty member who teaches your first-year seminar. The seminar is also assigned a link who is an upper class peer advisor to help students with some of the more personal or social transitions to living away from home for many of our students for the first time. And so you're going to find these multiple layers, everything from um, a resident advisor in the residence hall to your administrative dean to your faculty advisor. Once you declare your major, you will choose an academic advisor from your um, department where you've declared your major. So this advising system continues to provide support for students. I just want to highlight something that was talked about earlier is really just understanding the class size here at Colgate because with our average class size being just um, under 20 students you're going to have a chance to develop personal relationships with all of your faculty. So even if a faculty member isn't an advisor there may be someone you connect with simply by taking a course that you love or sharing a common interest and we also have over 80 percent of Colgate faculty live within the village of Hamilton or the surrounding communities. So it is important to understand this place and life in a residential college town like Colgate where our faculty are going to be sort of the fabric of your life as well. You're going to see them in the dining hall around campus and at events. And when you get to know them outside of the classroom, it breaks down the barriers to learning. And I think you'll find those advising and learning moments. There's a structured approach, but some of the great benefits of thinking about a school like Colgate is that you'll have those informal touches that really are what shape the student's experience. Can I, can I ask something, Gary? Please do. I think um, when you just touched on something that I think is really important, I think that informal advising is, is really a good thing to note for students because while you have the faculty that you work with and the administrators that are maybe assigned to you in specific ways, there are so many other people across campus that are interested in students' well-being and making sure that they have positive experiences here on campus or, God forbid, if something goes wrong, that they're there to respond in those times of need for students. And I think one of the important ways that you see that play out is just how you'll see the community interact with students in a, in a variety of different ways from President Brian Casey down to the janitorial staff and making sure that students are okay in specific situations, but also just being an ear if that's something that students need. I know in my own experience thus far, there have been several students that have come to me with either concerns or things that they're interested in 
in that they know that I have some particular experience with. And we just have very informal conversations about how they pursue those interests and people that they might talk to either on campus or in my network outside of the Colgate University community to help them navigate those specific problems. So I think that informal piece also really does a great job of, of kind of adding to and supplementing some of those formal relationships that our students will build, but also understanding that I feel like we all sitting here view ourselves as educators in specific ways. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't work at a place like Colgate if we didn't want to interact with students. And so I think that advising, while it comes in very specific formal kind of university level directives it also comes in just the general conversations and the everyday ways that we interact mm -hmm. with students and while none of us are, are faculty members there are students that I already feel like are people that I, I want to continue to mentor and cultivate relationships with. Terrific points. I remember last spring I was writing a recommendation for a student and I asked the student if uh, I could talk to her advisor and I didn't tell her at that point what my purpose was. I just said, could you please tell me who your advisor is? And she looked at me and she said, you mean the advisor that's going to show up on my permanent transcript record or the six or seven faculty and staff members <laughs> that I'm really close to who I consider to be my advisors as well? And I think that just fits into what it was that both of you really said about the type of community that this is. Thank you. This next question came to us from, again, two different cities, Boston and Houston. And the question is, Jameer, what is there to do on campus? <laughs> well, Garrett, this is always such an interesting question, I feel like, that we get from students because we're in this small town in central New York and people are like, what, like, what do people do here? <laughs> and I think one of the hardest things that I have in trying to answer this question is not that there's nothing to do but trying to help students understand a variety of different things that happen on our campus. Um, over 90% of our students live here. Mm -hmm. So it's not a place that it could just empties out on the weekend or people are going home or they're leaving and going to New York, New York City, which is several hours away from us. I think people need to understand and grasp that this is a residential community. And most of what's happening on campus is because our students are living here, learning here and being very involved and engaged in the community in so many different ways. We have over 190 clubs and organizations. We have varsity sports at the division one level, which have 25 of those programs that are competing. So definitely those are opportunities to engage with the community as well. Um, a local movie theater in town, lots of great restaurants downtown. The bookstore is right in the middle of our downtown. So that pretty much brings students into the community of Hamilton in a very specific and direct way. So I think that interaction between the town and gown is really important in terms of what students will do, whether it's community service service and outreach efforts, or just getting an opportunity to get to know the people that live in the town where you're, where you're going to school, I think those are important parts of the experience. In addition to the fact that the university will host many different lecture series and bringing prominent individuals to campus to share their experiences and what their life has been like and the successes that they've had, I think those are really cool opportunities to hear from people like former Vice President Joe Biden or the Dalai Lama and just kind of world-renowned individuals, not just Joe Blow or someone like that. Like you're going to get to hear from people who are exciting and who are dynamic and who have stories that you want to hear about. But also I think the variety of the types of clubs and organizations that we have are going to invite cultural events, religiously focused events, debates around policy and politics and kind of contemporary issues, opportunities for you to see the dynamic things that students are doing across campus, whether it be research or whether it be community efforts that they're involved with. Our students are really engaged and ambitious people. And so that invites, I think, a level of energy to this campus that's important to note and something I always tell students they need to come to campus to really experience because when you think about our location, you think about the type of institution that we are, you might get fooled. You might start to think that there aren't enough things to do, but there's so many different things that our students get involved with, and that's added on to the amount of academic <laughs> responsibility that they have already. So definitely, I think there's a ton for students to, to engage with. There's lots of different mini communities within this larger community for students to take advantage of. And a lot of times, I'll turn the question back on students, ask them, what is it that you want to do? Like, what are the things that you're interested in? What are you passionate about? And try to help them understand the ways that they might navigate that on our campus and some of the great opportunities that they have, both locally, regionally, as well as internationally, when you start to think about the amount of opportunities abroad that Colgate offers as well. That definitely, I think, starts to help them turn the wheels a little bit about the dynamic opportunities they'll have on campus. Terrific. 
Thank yeah, you. And, and just to add on, I think one quick thing I always try to put in perspective for students is just the size of Colgate. We're on the larger end of a liberal arts college experience with just under 3,000 students on our campus. And I think that reflects the range and depth of opportunities that Jameer referenced. But I think that context is important. And when you step foot on our campus, there is an energy of a bigger place. And that's where the visit becomes really important for students to be able to see how that residential, social, living, learning community comes together in a rural college town. Thank you both. Gina. Colgate is located in Hamilton, New York. <laughs> Hamilton, New York is a beautiful, small, rural community in an area of New York State known as Central New York, or as longtime locals will sometimes say, CNY. <laughs> and so a student from New Orleans was asking, how cold does it get? <laughs> You've been a CNY resident now for more than two decades. Could you respond to that student, please? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, we have all four seasons in CNY. <laughs> and so if a student is lucky enough to be here over the summer, they'll know the beautiful warm weather that we have, um, all of the events that people enjoy, like mountain biking and hiking and um, the outdoor activities. Uh, we have so many waterways in, in central New York. We have the other three seasons as well. Fall is beautiful. It, I think Colgate is one of the most beautiful campuses in the whole country. And the autumn colors and, and the hillside is just gorgeous. It snows here and it gets <laughs> cold here. And so I think my best advice for people is uh, you don't have to bring a winter coat with you, but um, we'll show you the direction to go shopping. Shopping's not too far from from here, a, a really big mall, I think one of the biggest ones in all of New York State. Um, so you need a really good winter coat and you need really warm, dry, waterproof winter boots. <laughs> and um, the, and then the spring is here before you know it and the, the bulbs are blooming and, and the birds are chirping. Um, I don't think I'm a meteorologist, so I can say what the actual temperature range is, um, but we, we do have some cold months. But the thing is, the facilities are good. Um, our, our physical plant staff and buildings and grounds, they make sure that we're plowed and shoveled out. And I think, uh, like I said, if you dress appropriately for the weather, um, you know, what's a, little, what's a little snow and cold? That sounds like the voice of experience to me. <laughs> All righty. Speaking of places that know a little bit about cold temperatures, Denver, Colorado has a student who wants to know, Jameer, about Colgate Athletics. The student said that Colgate has Division I athletics, which of course we do, but what if I want to play a sport not at the Division I athletic level? Can you talk about the opportunities available for that student, please? Definitely. In, in addition to our 25 varsity sports at the Division I level, Colgate has a whole host of club as well as intramural opportunities for students to take advantage of. And I think a lot of it for students is deciding like, if they're interested in club, are they interested in kind of the competition level there, or is intramurals and more of the recreation going to be the better fit for them and trying to determine like what's going to fit their competitiveness style and level of play and experience that they have with their particular sport. I think one of the great things is some of the unique opportunities in club sports. There's actually club figure skating, which when I first saw that was shocked by. It's like, colleges do that? <laughs> but I think it's a really great and unique opportunity for students who have these different interests to, again, find community with students that are doing those similar types of things. And one of the great opportunities here is because we have the level of athletics that we do, the facilities that students are able to utilize at a club as well as an intramural level are going to be really at a high level for them um, as they're thinking about recreation opportunities for themselves because of our Division One athletic programs that are here on campus. So it's a benefit for all of our students in many ways to be able to take advantage of some of the facilities that we have here on campus. But also I think as you, as you look at athletics, it brings I think a different and unique culture in terms of the school spirit here and allows us to be really proud of some of the opportunities um, and cheering on our fellow Raiders. But definitely there are other ways that students can pursue sport, um, other ways for recreation. That's also not to mention our um, very, very strong outdoor education program, which I think you alluded to mm -hmm. a little bit earlier, Gina, in terms of just some of the outdoor opportunities that students will find. We actually have a formal program that provides a lot of that access 
to those trips to do things like rock climbing and hiking or camping and skiing and snowboarding and some of those activities that are in our region. So definitely if you're someone who's an avid outdoors woman or avid outdoorsman, those opportunities are going to be available just on your own recreationally or through the outdoor education program and being able to utilize the resources that they provide even outside of kind of club sports and intramural sports opportunities. Thank you, Jameer. We hope that every student, no matter what college or university they attend, has a, a perfect college experience. But that's not the case for many students. Um, and with those students, they sometimes need various forms of support. One of those areas of support that they might need is in the area of mental health. And so, Lynn, would you mind talking about uh, uh, responding to a question that was raised to us by a Princeton, New Jersey student who wanted to know about the resources that Colgate has for a student who needs some support in the area of mental health. Sure, Gary, and as you said, you know, being a residential college community, we hope that everyone has a perfect transition and a perfect four years, um, but life can be complicated and there can be some stress involved with um, the student experience at the undergraduate level. And some of our students are coming into Colgate um, with some personal matters that they know will need to continue to be addressed in their undergraduate years. I wanna talk about two different opportunities um, for Colgate education in this matter. For First, I want to start and, and, and talk a bit about our, the Shaw Wellness Institute. Um, Colgate has a commitment to wellness just for our student, um, our undergraduate student experience. And the Wellness Institute is really a proactive approach to help all of our students engage in a healthy balance of mind and body during their time while they're here at Colgate. So whether it be fun events of pet therapy during finals or yoga or meditation or workshops on time management and stress management, we have that fully available in our, in our student experience. And we present that to students very early, even during orientation, to understand the benefit and the comfort of being able to reach out and know where the resources are. So we wanna make sure that every student is approaching their college experience here at Colgate with an open mind about wellness and that balance of where the resources might be. But some students may need to still besides focusing on wellness initiatives, need the support of a counselor um, or mental health support while they're here at Colgate. We do have a counseling system, a counseling division here at Colgate um, that really is equipped with high quality, talented, a team of professionals to meet the needs of our students. I actually had the ability to be on a panel with a few members of our counseling team just a few weeks ago and was really impressed to hear that not only do they schedule individual appointments, but they have urgent walk-in hours appointments available for students and they're able to meet the needs of a student traditionally with no more than a two or three day wait if a student is not able to get into the emergency hours. Um, that are scheduled by the Counseling Center. Our commitment is to students first and being in a residential environment, a student can't meet their best academic potential if they're not in their, their best personal place. And so our commitment first and foremost is going to be on active education, a community of support, and then a team of professionals if it gets to that point where students will need individual counseling to deal with their, their personal challenges. Thank you, Lynn, for talking so articulately about a really important point. One of the things that's always impressed me <clears throat> about our counseling and psychological support services at Colgate are the experts, the dedicated professionals who maintain the positions in that office, but also the way in which they maintain confidentiality. Mm -hmm. I've had some students talk with me about the counselors with whom they work and there was one occasion where I needed to call one of those counselors about a student, and the counselor wouldn't even talk with me about the student until she was 100% certain that the student was authorizing her to do that. And so I would hope that any student who's watching this webinar this evening who becomes a Colgate student, I hope you know that if the time comes that you feel you need to draw upon the services of the Counseling and Psychological Support Offices, 
you can do so with full confidence in knowing that what you say to those professionals will be maintained in a very professional and confidential way. All right, let's move on. We want to be transparent. The questions that we were asked as we travel around the country were not always phrased in the way that we would hope to see them phrased. <laughs> but for the purposes of this webinar, we are relying upon those questions to provide us with the information that we know so many students want to have. And so, Jameer, I'm going to ask this question that came to us in Brooklyn, New York, exactly the way it was asked of us. How do students get internships when you are in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I think uh, as you look at, again, going back to our location, Colgate is definitely a place that you don't necessarily stumble upon. It's an intentional decision to join this community and be a part of this community or even just coming for a visit. But I definitely don't feel like it's a place that's not connected um, globally to the world as well as to industry in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways that we're helping students in terms of internships is using our alumni as a resource. Um, we currently have 32,000 living alumni that are all over the world and working in a variety of different backgrounds and industries. And we're able to tap into that network to help students um, finding internships, but also finding mentors in industries that they're interested in. In addition to this kind of informal resource, we have a really dedicated career services staff. Mm -hmm. And career services does a really great job of working with students, both personally, but also in providing opportunities that our students are able to take advantage of in terms of job experiences and internship opportunities that allow them to get practical um, work in, in their four years as an undergraduate student, but also begin to build relationships and networks and industries that they might be interested in pursuing as a career after they graduate. So our dedicated staff will do everything from bring recruiters to campus that help students find internship opportunities. They also work with students and meet with them and advise them on things from the resume writing to interview prep and skills in that way. Um, we do a lot in terms of offering immersion trips for students that include practical experiences and opportunities to interact with professionals in areas that they're interested in. I'm um, taking students to the New York City area where they're focusing on things like arts or business and finance, which is a, a key area that many of our students are interested in working in. In fact, we have a group right now that's in Philadelphia through the Educational Studies Program that are having opportunities to learn, but also getting to work with community organizations and meet with higher education leaders and be, be able to facilitate opportunities that allow for their growth and practical experiences as part of a semester of learning that they're having. In addition to that, we help students find really intensive summer internships. I'm going to know a young man who spent the summer between his sophomore and junior year this, this, this past summer. I'm working with the Quicken Loans organization, and he was working with their business analyst team, flying across the country, meeting with their clients and partners and being able to provide services while also learning from their team of professionals. So definitely, as you think about kind of the level of those opportunities, they'll be different depending upon what students are interested in. But you also can't forget that a college campus is in many ways an enterprise in and of itself. And so there are a lot of different opportunities in administrative and academic departments right here at Colgate where students are finding work opportunities and internship experiences that allow for kind of growth and leadership and skill building that's really important for life after college. So it may not be that you're having to wait until a summer. You may be working alongside faculty and administrators throughout the school year getting to really hone your skills um, in, your, in your professional development as a student. So those are important opportunities opportunities that our students are able to take advantage of as well. So I think we're doing a great job of marrying both informal as well as formal resources and supports, bringing people to campus that offer a lot of great opportunities for students, helping students navigate finding those really lucrative and immersive types of internship experiences. And I think one of the most important things that Colgate does is say a student finds an unpaid internship for a summer that's the perfect internship for the industry or career that they're interested in working in. But maybe that idea of not being paid for the summer is a barrier for them in some way. Colgate actually has set aside funding to actually pay students to do unpaid internships. And I think that's key to showing a level of commitment to making sure students are able to build the type of networks that they're looking for in the industries that they're interested in working in and that financial piece not be the reason why they don't take advantage of those opportunities, recognizing the different backgrounds that our students are coming from. So I think that's important to note as well. But definitely we want to make sure that all of our students are 
utilizing these connections and resources that we have. So the Career Services will also host workshops. They invite first and second year students to, to those programs specifically to begin that process early on. There are programs that are, that are actually geared towards our first and second year students to help you begin to navigate these industry areas that you're interested in and then make that transition into that more immersive internship experience that a student might be looking for. Great response, a lot of important information, Jameer. One of the things that I'm proudest of about Colgate students is that they are doers. Mm -hmm. And I think most Colgate students understand that the ideal internship is not going to jump out at you, that it's going to take some work in order to identify that internship. And our Career Counseling Center is there and ready to assist students from, as you mentioned, quite literally their first year. And I was so pleased to hear that last year's first year class, the current sophomore class, 98% of them took advantage of the opportunity to have contact and meet with career services. That's a great way to get a great start on the ideal internship. And one piece of advice for those of you who will be here next fall, please take advantage of career services. It's an outstanding, outstanding resource that Colgate has. And what's more, you'll be able to find them in a brand new building called Benton Hall, where their resources will even be better because of that spectacular new facility when it opens up in the fall of 2018. Let's talk about campus politics. Sometimes politics reflects the world around us. Sometimes it reflects the political issues that might be circulating in a smaller community or just the campus community. But a student, Lynn, in Kansas City, Missouri, was curious about how far to the left does Colgate lean politically? I think in the course of the last year, a lot of students are asking about political discourse on college campuses, and I think that's sort of reflective of where we are as a, as a nation um, in the United States after the election last year, just people being aware of, of political conversations. One thing that I love about being on Colgate's campus, as Gary said earlier, our students are doers. They're doers, they're thinkers, they're involved in conversations. Um, and definitely many conversations on our campus may take place around the element of politics and things that are happening in our society. Um, ultimately, we reflect society at large and our students are going to be politically keen and aware of conversations. What I love is that all voices are also heard on our campus. Um, we are going to have a college Democrats. We also have a college Republican group. Um, and what is really important is to understand that we are going to be an institution where students will have their an opportunity to have their voice heard, where there will be active conversations, but it is done so in, a, in an area of respect as well. Um, our students are going to be involved in political conversations and they'll bring forward conversations that they think our students need to be aware of as an educated campus community. Um, in general, many institutions of higher education do tend to be a little leaning towards the left, but what I love about Colgate is that we do have a range of voices on our campus, and I think that keeps our student body in check and learn to be respectful and open to a variety of opinions and conversations. Thank you, Lynn. Jameer, this question came to us from a student in Dallas, Texas, and it's very important for students of all different backgrounds and traditions. The question is, what is diversity like on the Colgate University campus? Uh, good question, Gary, and I think as you look at the broad scope of higher education right now, diversity and inclusion is really at, at the top of every list on every college campus. And I think even here at Colgate, we have to continue to assess what does that mean for us as a community. I think in terms of looking at facts and figures and numbers, Colgate is very diverse in some ways and not as diverse in other ways. Um, currently, we have students that geographically represent 48 of the 50 states and over 70 countries across the world, so very diverse in terms of geographic. Um, where geographics of where our students come from, but also um, we start to look at kind of the socioeconomic diversity on our campus as well. That's another area where you can say, um, in terms of statistics, 
done a great job of attracting students who are coming from a variety of different backgrounds, with over 40% of our students currently receiving financial aid from the institution. But then also when you start to look at ethnic diversity, which I, I think is at the heart of this type of a question, um, that is where you can begin to say Colgate still has work to do. Um, when you look at about 70% of our students identifying as, as white, I think that for many students can be a concern if they're coming from places that are much more diverse ethnically and thinking about, well, how do I make that transition? And how do I feel comfortable in a place that um, maybe isn't as ethnically diverse as the community that I'm coming from? And I think a lot of times when we're talking with students, we have to help them understand, one, in terms of our size, which Lynn mentioned earlier, being a little bit larger as an institution of this type that allows us to have kind of larger groups of students who are coming from diverse backgrounds, even though those percentages might be smaller, um, that just sheer size allows us to have more students from different um, demographics and ethnic backgrounds. Also, that again, builds into the types of clubs and organizations that are here on campus and support organizations and communities that students will find within those groups. Uh, there's a fair amount of diversity in the types of organizations that exist on this campus, but also that these are conversations that are being had at the highest levels on this institution's uh, campus, just like you're going to find on other campuses across the country. And I think that amount of intention um, and, and detail being put towards diversity work lends towards where Colgate sees itself in terms of diversity and equity and inclusion on our campus and wanting to make sure that all students feel comfortable and are able to get the most out of their experience while they're here. So I think definitely there's diversity of different types. There's students that are coming from a variety of different backgrounds in terms of just ethnic diversity. I think definitely like many college campuses, we can continue to improve, but I also feel like those conversations are being had and people care about those issues. And much like um, we mentioned, when we talk about our students as doers, they're doers in this arena as well. And they're part of those conversations, whether they're sitting on committees, whether they're meeting with the president um, himself, whether um, they're letting us know through protest or other um, forms of uh, presentation that they're not happy with what we're doing. I think this is a place where our students will be heard and continue to push us to be better in terms of the types of resources and the type of community that we put together as, as an admission office and making sure that we are in recognition of, of uh, the growth that can be had in terms of the diversity and inclusion efforts <coughs> that are happening on this campus. So I definitely feel like um, we're continuing to improve, we're continuing to have the types of conversations that we need to have. And I think the fact that our students are a part of that is an important piece to note when we think about what diversity looks like currently and in the future of this institution. Thank you, Jameer. Lynn, Seattle, Washington is known for many different things, mm -hmm. and they have at least one student who wants to know how do students get around on campus, and even more importantly, how do they get here in the first place? <laughs> As, um, as Jameer mentioned earlier, we are an intentional destination um, in central New York. But um, first, let me talk about the campus community um, here at Colgate. Once a student arrives on campus, we are absolutely a pedestrian campus, and we encourage that. Um, we do have a Colgate, uh, the Colgate Cruiser, which is our shuttle bus system, which will take students from various points of the campus community into town to the grocery shop, uh, grocery store and local shops. Um, and back to campus, but we really are very much a pedestrian campus. It's easy to walk from the farthest points of our campus community and really no more than about 15 minutes. And so we do, in, although we allow first year students to have cars on campus, parking um, can be a challenge on Colgate's campus. So we do encourage you if you use your car to get to campus, park it once you get here and then definitely um, or use your feet, Colgate shuttle bus, um, whatever you might need to get around campus. Colgate is also a very sustainable campus. We have a green bikes program. We encourage people to be thoughtful about their interaction with the environment. And again, that's another reason to encourage you to park your car and, and use other modes of transportation. Um, the student asking the question from Seattle, Washington is also thinking about how do I get to central New York? Um, Colgate's, uh, the closest airport to Colgate's campus is in Sarah Syracuse, New York, which is just about an hour from our campus. Um, Colgate's calendar is what we call a 4-4 calendar with um, students taking four classes in the fall, four classes in the spring, 14 weeks each semester. And we have some set breaks during that timeline. Typically during the set breaks from Colgate's campus, we will have um, school-sponsored 
trips to uh, shuttle buses to the local airport. It is important to understand the demographics of our campus community and the fact that we do have slightly over 50% of our students from New York plus the greater New England area, but about nearly half of our campus is outside of a comfortable driving distance. So we are used to helping students get to and from campus and we will provide um, some shuttle transportation to the airport around those schedule breaks and holidays. We do have a Colgate On Demand shuttle for students who may need to arrange that transportation to and from the airport on an off weekend that may not be a scheduled Colgate break or holiday. Thank you, Lynn. All righty. Well, we are wrapping up. It's been such a joy to be able to talk with all of you and to discuss Colgate and the application process in the financial aid world. But before we sign off, I thought I would turn to each of my colleagues and ask them if they have one piece of advice that they would like to leave with you or one uh, piece of information about Colgate that perhaps we haven't been able to discuss during our time together on this webinar. So Jameer, why don't I lead off with, with you and um, ask if you would like to impart any final words of wisdom with our viewers today. Yes, I think as you go through your application process, wherever it is that you're looking, make sure that you do reach out and ask questions. I think we had a lot of great questions here, but there may be additional things that you want to know about or about your specific um, situation. I think it's so important to make sure that you understand the institutions that you're looking at and that you're interested in applying to and take that extra time to talk with an admission officer or a financial aid officer just to have a good sense of what it is that you're looking for in a place. So take that time to pick up the phone, shoot an email, whatever you need to do, ask a lot of questions. Great advice. Lynn. Okay, I would say if, if parents, students, whoever may be watching, the goal of this process is about finding the right college fit and have some fun while you're doing that. I feel like we hit upon some serious topics today and some important topics and language that you need to understand as you go throughout the college search process, but ultimately this educational journey you're about to embark on, finding that right college fit is really a gift. And there are a number of wonderful institutions. Colgate is just one of many. Um, but the more fun, the more relaxed you are, the more you let yourself really enjoy the process, the better off you're going to find in finding that perfect fit for college. Thank you, Lynn. I think my piece of advice is check your portal. We will try to be really clear about the application materials that are needed for on both the admission side and the financial aid side. So we will do our best to provide you with links and information so that you know you have completed all of your admission and financial aid materials uh, by our deadlines. Thank you. I'd also like to encourage you to let us know if it would be useful for you to talk with a student. Working in our office every day are a terrific team of senior admission fellows who come from all around the country and represent a wide variety of backgrounds. Any one of them would be happy to be in touch with you. If you'd rather talk to someone who's a first year student or a second year student, let us know that. We can certainly put you in touch with a student who's in one of those classes. Maybe you'd like to talk with a student who's been on one of our off-campus study programs or a student who's val balancing the challenges of being a Division I athlete while being a standout at the same time in the classroom. We can put you in touch with that student. The point is, we want to take as much of the mystery out of this process as we possibly can. And we urge you to be in touch with us if we can assist you in making that possible for you as it relates to your interest in Colgate University. Finally, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at what appears directly below the screen. We've linked below the timestamp for each question that's been covered during the course of our webinar. And we've done that so that you can navigate easily into those sections that you find to be most relevant. So we hope you'll take advantage of that and let us know, um, of course, if there's anything that we might have missed that you would like to hear more about. Some of you uh, might not be aware of our application deadlines. 
For early decision, our deadline is a submission date of November 15. And assuming you make that date and your application is complete, we will have a response to you no later than December 15. For those of you who are thinking about regular or early decision two, you would want to have your application submitted to us no later than January 15th. Really appreciate your time on behalf of all of my colleagues here who have been on our panel today. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your interest in Colgate University. And really, on behalf of all of us at Colgate, whether we are in the admission and financial aid office, whether we're in the student body, whether we're on the faculty, whether we're a member of the staff, anyone associated with Colgate, I think we can all enthusiastically agree on one point, and that is that we hope the four years of your undergraduate college or university experience provides you with an outstanding education and four years of memories and experiences that you will cherish for the rest of your life. Thanks very much for your time and have a great rest of your day.